available now at whitepillbook.com. This episode is brought to you by Patriot Gold. Good afternoon, Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us a returning guest, one of my favorite people, one of the very few people I know who I will actually trust when it comes to giving me advice and useful information. Mike Cernovich, author of Guerrilla Mindset and popular cultural commentator. Mike, one of the things, uh, there's two things people have been going after you on Twitter in recent weeks, uh, which kind of speaks to a broader issue in our culture, and I wanted to have you address them each in turn. One of them is the Trump uh, candidacy and, and Trump's attempt to get reelected. You were an integral part of the whole movement that culminated in the election of Donald Trump in 2016. Uh, you have in recent term, recent months, been far more critical of him as a person and as a candidate. Uh, as a result of this, MAGA has had no problem calling you a sellout, grifter, traitor, loser, and so you know the list of uh, lefty, uh, TDS, and all these other good things. Um, I just want to hear your perspective on whether Trump has changed and ballpark his odds of getting the nomination and reclaiming the presidency. Sure. That's a weird thing about, as I'm sure you know, you become this weird Forrest Gump character where people, they find <laughs> you and then they don't know anything about you. So I'm, I'm, what I'm dealing with now is that I'm a never Trumper and I came onto the scene recently because I didn't exist. I didn't throw the biggest inauguration event of Trump's first term. It was deplorable. I didn't throw another event in New York that you never attended where Antifa came and almost killed a guy after I never did any of this. You know, I'm just some grifter who came onto the scene from out of nowhere, maybe, maybe put up by the CIA. Maybe I'm paid by the national review or the dispatch who knows, but I came from nowhere and my goal is to divide the base. And that's what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm either controlled opposition, um, a grifter, which is weird. I have a sub stack and that's kind of about it, which you can pay for or not. My book, I don't even promote. It, it did so well that I don't want to annoy regular readers. Most people don't even have a book. Um, or, yeah, or I'm a trader because my views have evolved over, over the years. It's a very it's strange, man. And I'm sure you deal with this too all the time that, but the, the, the positive to that though, is it shows that if you just keep plugging and pushing forward, that even if people hate you today, they, they, a uh, week later, oh, why do I hate that guy? Oh, you got to remind me. Okay. Give me, you know, give me something new. That's where we are. The quote unquote anti-Trump position was started in probably 2017 when he fired General Flynn because if you would remember, there was a lot of pressure during the campaign for Trump to fire Corey Lewandowski based on what we now know would not have been sound reasons. There had been all this pressure on Trump to apologize, to do basically everything that doesn't work and that doesn't win elections. And he never did. And I thought, okay, okay, this guy's going to do things. And then he Peter principled himself out, right? According to the Peter principle, everyone reaches their level of incompetency because if you're great at your current job, then you get a better job and a better job. And then eventually you're in a job that you don't belong in that happened with Trump. So 2017, I, I realized with the firing of general Flynn, that there was going to be a lot of problems with him. And that's how it played out primarily through his presidency, unforced air after unforced air due almost totally in part to never wanting to know what the buttons do, right? That you would think you, me, anybody else becomes president. First thing you do is you sit at the table and you go, first you go, oh, wow, this is surreal, <laughs> yeah. right? You get over that. And then you say, show me the buttons. Like what, you know, how do I, how do I do things? And he never had any interest on that. In fact, he was quite, more interested in redecorating the White House. These are all true things that I say, because if you notice who goes after me, it isn't people who worked in the White House who go after me. 
they don't agree with me necessarily, or they don't co-sign because everybody has their own role to play in life. But you don't see the people who worked in the White House going, oh, yeah, that's totally wrong. Cernovich is just wrong on that. He did. He's wrong. Nope. None of them say that. It's the people who are the furthest away who had no access or information or sourcing who are claiming that everything that I said was wrong. And you were around at the time, if you remember, in 2017, 2018, my reporting on the National Security Council and a number of Pentagon affairs was so good that H.R. McMaster held a meeting about me. And this was written about in Foreign Affairs magazine. And the tenor of the article was that me, Cernovich, by reporting on what was happening in the National Security Council, I was actually harassing people who worked at the NSC. This, this can all be, you know, you can go find Foreign Affairs, Mike Cernovich, H.R. McMaster. So, so I have these people who are, quote unquote, MAGA, telling me that, oh, you don't know anything. It's like, OK, how many reporters or even if I'm not even a reporter, I'm a cultural commentator, whatever people want to say, how many people have ever had the national security advisor to the United States of America hold an all hands meeting about you, right? right? They haven't. So my sourcing was all good. And I saw a lot of the problems that, that Trump was facing. And unfortunately, more often than not, I was, I was right. But do you think he has a path to both the nomination and the presidency again? What, what, can you handicap that from your perspective? The nomination is hard to see him not winning the nomination, but a lot can happen. There's that E, um, what's her name? E Janice Carroll or someone has that definition. E. Carroll. Yeah. Right. And I read some of his deposition transcripts from that. And I think it's a New York jury. So he said, she said thing. I personally don't think that that was a Trump thing that he would have done that as my personal opinion. But if you're a New York jury, who are you going to side with, right? So that that's going to stick. So if you go to a jury trial in, in a civil case for the R word, then and you're a left wing jury and they rule against you, that's hard, right? You can push through a lot of things, even though, again, people are highly skeptical of it as they should be, because you know for all these years we never heard anything about Trump doing stuff like that. And then he becomes a lightning rod for politics. And now, and then it was nonstop unrelenting. But his deposition transcript showed him doing a lot of filibustering, a lot of stonewalling that we're fond of, but it's missing its edge. So, so I wouldn't say there's no chance of DeSantis. If I had to bet, um, then I'd bet on Trump, depending on the odds, obviously. But if you're like, okay, 50-50, I'm going to take Trump. 60-40, going to take Trump. 70-30, okay, now – you know, now we can have a discussion about odds, but the general, there's no chance. I mean, we're talking 90, 10 odds on that because what, what, what do you learn from 2020 and what do they learn in the last midterms with Carrie Lake? Carrie Lake is now saying I, I would have won by 500,000 votes. Well, they, didn't, they, they didn't learn anything, right? There's, there was no level up. So how does Trump win in 2024 general when they didn't even figure out 2020 and you, you don't you are going to have competent legal representation are you going to have proper legal teams one thing after another so the general would be a very bleak um, experience for for uh, trump yeah I, i've i've never under so the people who think that 2020 was stolen from them i don't understand they will acknowledge freely that Hillary Clinton got many more votes in 2016 than Trump. And there's this hand waving that it doesn't matter. And it's like, listen, if I, you know, started ahead of you in one race by like whatever, 10 meters, and I'm racing you again, it does matter, you know, having the, if to demonstrate, I have more people to run who want to, vote for me in one year, it's more likely there are going to be more people who are going to vote for me than the second time around. And if you are going to make the argument that it was stolen, how do you prevent that from happening in when you're outside the White House, when you have the power of the White House against you? And the other question right. MAGA hasn't answered, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, is if he gets into the White House, McConnell's going to team up with the Democrats in an impeachment trial and get him out of there. I have I had you know Roger Stone on my show last week. And I asked him about this and I said, 
why wouldn't McConnell get the 17 Republicans he needs to team up with the Democrats or whatever, how many Democrats to get Trump removed? And he just went on this whole tear about how McConnell's a crook, which just proves that. Yes, he is a crook. And that's why as a crook, he would absolutely do what he needed to do to get Trump out of office. Right. You raised the two points. One is, why do you believe that the 2024 election was not fair when Trump lost by 50,000 votes in three states? But he won in 20 or rather 2020 election yeah. and um, he lost by slim margin air. He won in 2016 by a slim margin, I think 80,000 votes in four states. Nancy Pelosi only had a 222 person Democrat majority in the last Congress. Republicans, they won the popular vote for the House and they have it last I checked it's 222. So plus or minus. So why is it? That's what I my, my challenge to MAGA people is. Why is it hard to believe that when you're winning or losing election by essentially 100,000 votes and you won one in 2016 that you couldn't have possibly have lost in 2020? I, I need to know. I need to know. And then I have an answer for that. So then I go, OK, well, I will just make a thought experiment philosophically and say, let's just assume that you're right and that it was stolen. And I hope we're not getting your channel flagged or whatever because we're having a discussion. I don't know how the rules work, but right. I'll just I'll roll with it. OK, I agree with your premise for the sake of argument. What's Trump going to do differently to prevent it? But during this, right, they don't have an answer. So they, they don't have a, they don't have a coherent answer for one. They don't have a coherent answer for two. And now they're saying that Carrie Lake had her election stolen from her in Arizona. OK, well, one, how did that happen? Okay, you don't have an explanation for it. Um, two, we just we don't like Katie Hobbs. Oh wow, that goes back to when you would know this is a historian. Somebody I can't remember who said it. Maybe you remember, but they the person said, "How did Nixon win? None of my friends voted for him." Right? No, no, it's even worse. So that's in the, my book. Then you write Pauline Kael. She wrote for the New Yorker. And what's interesting is I think a National Review writer went back to find the actual quote, and the actual quote is even worse because she was a movie critic. And she talked about how I know that they're out there. And sometimes when in the movie theater, like I feel like them around me, but I don't happen to know anyone. So it's not even that she was surprised. She was more like disgusted at the idea that some of these Nixon voters are in her physical proximity. Right. And that and that's an issue that people who are hyper partisan struggle with is that if you really like someone, then they hate they're hated. And if you hate someone, that person is loved. You always have a top side and a negative energy because politics is by its very nature divisive. Almost no one other than even today, other than Dolly Parton, is anyone truly loved in America, right? No, everyone, even The Rock is divisive. Everyone's divisive now. Even if you try not to be like Joe Rogan, you're divisive. Doesn't matter. And that, so that should tell you if you're a, a Trump person or a Carrie Lake person, Oh, yeah, they just people really hate them. And I don't know what we can do about that. Or it's going to be a close election. What can we do? So, again, there's no there's no answer. What are you going to do then in 2020? We don't have an answer. OK, well, that's a problem. And then, of course, we just dealt with this. And this is where I think people debase themselves. We all have not you, fortunately, not me much, fortunately, but collectively, you know, we all have to kind of toe the line to some degree. And if you're a MAGA influencer, you have to toe the line that Trump is good and DeSantis should not be the nominee. I'm perfectly fine with that. That's what you have to do. But people were saying you can't trust DeSantis because he's establishment because he was meeting with Kevin McCarthy. And then, of course, Trump endorses Kevin McCarthy for Speaker of the House a week later. And then that talking point kind of goes away. It's like, wait a minute, I heard that you can't trust the Santos because he's with McCarthy, but Trump supported McCarthy. And then, well, forget, forget I even said that. So there's a lot of, unfortunately, people debasing themselves by, I call it serving up the gen generic slop. You know, you got to, you got to play the talking point sometimes if you want to be reinvited to Mar a lago And I'm, I'm not going to judge people for that, but you don't have to. You have to do that. You have to debase yourself that much, right? Yeah, you he can also have... endorsed McConnell for re-election, and he endorsed Pelosi to be speaker. And when you point this out, people either say he has to play the game or he's learned his lesson. I right. think the first um, argument makes Lindsey much more Graham, sense. 
Yeah, Lindsey oh, Graham's yeah. on the South Carolina leadership thing. He appointed Ray one thing after another, and then they go, well, you got to play the game. It's like, well, which is it? Is he draining the swamp or is he playing the game? Oh, well, he has to. It's got catch-22, right? He, I feel like you could rewrite catch-22 today using the same theme, just creating different live dialogue. Well, you got to play the game to drain the swamp. No, you can't. No, they're, they're actually two. They're entirely different things. What you would do if you want to drain the swamp is you'd almost have to become a martyr. So Trump could have pardoned all those January 6th people who were nonviolent, said, hey, go after the 50 or 100 people who are being hooligans. But anybody who just walked in because they didn't know that you couldn't walk in, give them a pardon. And then he would have been convicted as an, as an impeachment trial. And he would have went down as a president who can't run for re-election. But that would have been draining the swamp. That would have been, that's the only way to drain the swamp. If you drain the swamp, you're a martyr. And if you don't want to be a martyr, which I say often, I often, I, um, when things are getting a little hot, I always say there's only one martyr that I care about, and that's Jesus Christ. And I have no Jesus Christ complex. I have no desire to be crucified publicly for anything. So if you're Trump, I don't expect him to be a martyr, but then just don't say drain the swamp. Just say, here's what we got to do. I thought I could do more. You got to play the game a little bit. We'll do the best we can. And that's how I feel with the Santas. So Mike, before you answer that, let me talk for a little bit about Patriot Gold. Now, BlackRock is warning to prepare for a recession unlike any other in history has proven that the only way the, fate, the Fed can fight inflation is with a recession. And everyone's New Year's resolution is to buy gold and silver. Over 80% of retirees are concerned about inflation and very concerned about the stock market. In 2008, the stock market and housing market crashed. Meanwhile, gold went from 800 an ounce to 1600 an ounce over the next two and a half years. And the big banks and billionaires agree on two things. One, we're heading toward a recession. Food prices are going through the roof. Energy bills are skyrocketing. People are getting laid off left and right. Two, investors need to buy gold. Several analysts are predicting these will hit all-time highs. It's the only capital that will be worth something if you know what hits the fan. And what else can you invest in that will hold its value like gold? So the Patriot Gold Group is introducing the 2023 Recession Protection No Fee for Life IRA. You can call the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late. You don't want to be that person looking at your 401k crying. You'll get best-in-class service from Patriots Protecting Patriots. Patriot Gold, Patriot Gold Group has the No Fee for Life IRA, where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold or silver, and you may be eligible for the No Fee for Life IRA on qualifying rollovers. All you have to do is call 888-505-9845 to get a free investor guide. Mention my name, Michael Malice, or go to malicegold.com. Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs' top-rated gold IRA dealer six years in a row. So call 888-505-9845 or just go to malicegold.com to check out what they're all about. Folks, your welcome is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Now, most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yet, while you're listening to us talk, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, maybe grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you could be doing right now, which is getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching Progressive save nearly $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles in your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progress will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive, which is Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12 month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Let's get back to the show. The, the, the... The number one like downside to DeSantis is that with Trump, there was like always a chance, right? You thought, okay, maybe Julian Assange would get a pardon. There's a with DeSantis, no, he's by the book. All the fun things that we want done, and and, and I don't want to just say they're fun, but the things that I think are impactful, that matter, that are moral and righteous, he's not going to do any of that stuff. But on the other hand, he because he's with the establishment, you have to have the establishment to win in 2024, unfortunately. But on the other hand, there are establishment things that you could do. So, for example, Trump in 2020 canceled all contracts for DEI training. And that was McConnell didn't have a problem with that. There, there are a number of things that you can right. do that can put the country in a better direction, at least as I see it, that our establishment. So DeSantis can go in. He could change how colleges are funded. Remember Trump? 
the DOJ sued Harvard for racial discrimination, and then Biden comes in, they want to dismiss it. Well, McConnell was fine with that lawsuit against Harvard. So there are a lot of things that you can do. But the foreign wars, unfortunately, they're just a number of things that I don't like that are going to happen. So it is a was at the point, though, where you can't win. So you you're, it's like you're 40 years old and you're thinking about marriage. Well, you you're you got to kind of get married now. You you're not you know, you're not 25 or 28. You're going to marry and you're going to make an acceptable choice. And with Trump, you just there's no hope of winning the general. So you can either get an imperfect DeSantis who will do a lot of good. And maybe it's too late to make meaningful change in the country or you just lose. Well, that's that's your real choice. And that's a, that's what, unfortunately, a lot of people can't accept. That's your choice. Your choice is DeSantis, who probably won't do a lot of the things that we would like him to do, but he will do some things that we want him to do, or he can lose. Which What's your choice? Well, Trump will clearly win in 2024. How? The election was just stolen from Carrie Lake, and it was stolen in 2020, according to all you people. So what are they going to do? Well, I don't know. Right. So accepting your premise is true that these things were stolen. You have no answer. You've therefore conceded the point to me that Trump has no chance of winning. DeSantis has a small chance. So go with which one? The horse with a chance of winning. Do you, uh, uh, so there's another um, argument for Trump that I want to hear your thoughts on. The argument is this, that any Republican who is the nominee or the, or who becomes president is going to be attacked as vociferously as President Trump was. And therefore, if you have a weaker candidate, as a weaker person, as they claim DeSantis is, therefore, the attacks are actually going to stick this time, whereas only Trump, who is really taken with himself and, and has a huge ego, but that huge ego is useful in politics because when people you know, accuse you of all these sorts of things, it's, it's going to be water off a duck's back. So do you think that that is an accurate pro-Trump argument? No, because... We were calling him, not we, but the media was calling him Death Santas. Right. People, people forget all that. MAGA wants to forget the lockdowns and the vaccine and everything because all the things they don't like, Trump pushed. So now, of course, they're rewriting history and saying Trump never supported lockdowns. Just like, oh, my God, here's this tweet about. And then they go, well, he was misled by his advisors. It's like, OK, well, you people, it's like you just you, it, it's very frustrating. I've often said my haters don't really bother me because. They're adversaries, and your adversary's job is to try to win. It's my kind of semi-fans who frustrate me more than anyone because it's like, okay, then don't say Trump didn't support the lockdowns. He did, right? It's like it's like you're lying to me. You're 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 a gaslighter. Just say, well, he did support the lockdowns. He was conned by Fauci. Okay, fine. You can you can say that. That's fine. But you can't go. Well, he didn't support the lockdowns. And as president, he now power for the lockdowns. And then I show you a tweet going, well, Trump said he had the power to do lockdowns. He said he supported them. He said Sweden paid a heavy price for not doing them. And he yelled at Kemp for not doing it. And he kind of bullied DeSantis to do it. So Florida was locked down for a couple of weeks, which as a DeSantis supporter, I'll admit that. There was a panic. People said, well, let's try it out. They tried it out. They realized it didn't work. And Florida opened right back up. And Florida has the best economy of the world um, or in the country hottest growing ones, which shows you that a short lockdown wasn't what the catastrophe was. Because that's where MAGA, again, is trying to rewrite history. Oh, well, the lockdown. No, it wasn't the lockdowns. It was the lockdowns, the school closures, the reopening, and then the re-lockdowns. It was a hundred different other things. It wasn't that people thought, hey, let's give it a go. And then you gave it a go and you realized that, okay, it doesn't matter. Just some percentage of people are going to get it. Some percentage are, you know, going to die. Probably more people will die if you have lockdowns. You're making a trade off like an adult, and they don't want to do that. So he was death Santas. Remember that was a very vicious time, and he handled it fine. He doesn't even talk to the media anymore. He he just shuts them out. Whereas Trump, you know, takes every call. Bob Woodward, and then of course Trump is saying, "How dare Bob Woodward lie about what I said?" And then Bob Woodward releases tapes, sells millions of books. How many MAGA people have that kind of access to Trump, right? The oral history of the Donald Trump. I'm sure how many conservatives would line up to write the oral history of Trump's time in the White House and make millions of dollars? No, but Bob Woodward can and Maggie Haberman can and everyone else can and Trump will talk to them. So the idea that Trump is a master of the media, he was good in 2016, but the game has changed. The game now is you just don't cooperate with him. 
the game you right. know, used to be that you would use them to amplify them. And now the game is you just don't, you just don't talk to them because they don't have any ratings. And that's why all the subscription data and everything is going. Washington Post was going to have layoffs. There's a bunch of media layoffs happening because if you don't cooperate, they don't have anything to write. It's just another, oh, somebody said something one time, but they're not. No, what they can write, sorry, what they can write is, oh, Ron DeSantis refuses to talk to us. This is an outrage. You can only right. read that article as a reader who hates DeSantis so many times. It's the same article. Right. So all the ratings are down. And so DeSantis has the more effective media strategy. He has, he has the better media people. You know that you have good media people when the media is writing about how your media people are <laughs> bad people, right? <laughs> so that, yeah. that argument for Trump fails. The only argument that I see for Trump is he turned states that you never thought would be red, red. He did. No, Nobody thought that in 2020, I remember I was at election night party. Nobody thought Ohio and Florida would be called at whatever, eight or right. nine. Right. So a lot of people think that DeSantis can't bring out the Rust Belt voters that you need in these close elections the way Trump can. That is an open question to me. So on that, I would say, so when, when I, and the funny thing is I have to actually make arguments for MAGA because they can't even argue their case as well as I can. They're so far up their own buttholes about the, you know, the, the stolen election or whatever that they can't even make. I have to, in my own mind go, hmm, you know, hmm, what would I say if I were them? And I go, okay, here's what I would say. And then in my own mind, I have to find out if that's a true thing or a not true statement. So I'm left with, I, I'm not sure yet on that. I don't know, but I do know DeSantis is extremely popular. He transformed for Florida. He, the Florida legislator, I wrote this big piece on to plug my sub stack, but I wrote a, what I thought was the best piece about the midterms. And the point I make, cause I, cause I actually talked to people and which is weird. A lot of MAGA influence, influences don't just, they don't talk to people. So strange. You just write what your thoughts are. Whereas you are, you do more research <laughs> And I don't do as much research as you, but I'm kind of like, oh, I'll call somebody and ask them like, hey, what was up with New York? And they go, oh, yeah, Lee Zeldin, he ran. He probably knew he was going to lose, but he got a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of hype. So he was able to probably pull up a couple of people who wouldn't have won Congress. And you go, oh, wow, OK. The House barely has a majority. Zeldin probably got him a couple of seats, including George Santos. And then and according to the rules of the new right, George Santos doesn't resign and nobody pushes him to resign. When Dick Blumenthal and Joe Biden resign, then we can talk about George Santos. So that's another cultural shift that the people who attack me don't realize I was in the forefront. By the way, the new right doesn't even include me anymore. There's like a new, new right now. And they pretend like you never wrote a book, The New Right, because Vanity Fair did that piece on The New Right. And I'm, right. Not, even, I'm not even in it. So that, that's, how, that's how you know when you're kind of ancient, right? where people, they don't even know who you are or they attack you for things that you're like, no, I was a predecessor to all this and you don't even have that basic understanding. But according to the rules of the new right that I was in large part um, created these rules and the culture changed the culture is, well, I mean, George Santos doesn't resign until Dick Blumenthal does. And then a Blumenthal does, sure, you know, we'll, we'll sacrifice players like on a chessboard, but we're not going to do that. And then you look at Florida, the Florida legislator drafted a legislative map. DeSantis said, no, this isn't good enough, ripped it up, did a new one. And now Republicans, because of that, they got a couple seats that Democrats claim they shouldn't. So there's actually going to be a federal trial about the map that DeSantis did. So if you don't have Zeldin, you don't have DeSantis, you don't have a GOP House majority, right? That, that, and what did they do? They did what Trump never did, which is the Gen X meth methodological or methodology of just looking at a map, doing the, <laughs> doing the math, saying, OK, it's not enough for me just to be bombastic and, and give a talk. I need to actually sit down and say, what, what are the districts looking like? And because of that, they won. And again, though, narrowly, narrowly. Which, but then you look at Pelosi won narrowly. It just feels like Democrats have more power because they're more united and they really right. rush their agenda through. So you probably felt like, it probably felt like Pelosi had a super majority because of everything they pushed through with, again, almost no resistance from McConnell in the Senate. 
which is another problem. But it felt like Democrats had um, a majority in the Senate and a supermajority in the House. And then you look, not really. I was actually surprised myself because when I went to do this article, I go, Pelosi only had that many? Even me, and I'm pretty plugged in, didn't realize how narrow her majority was. So when you're winning by, it's like, um, I, saw, I saw a funny video the other day, a guy, and he was joking, but he did a sprint and he did a 12 second sprint. And he said, I'm only two seconds away from beating Usain Bolt, right? <laughs> and you're like, yeah, yeah, it's only two seconds. You're right. You're, that's, you couldn't win a junior high track meet. But if you, if you just look at it with kind of like maybe how Trump would, oh, yeah, I mean, I'm almost there. I'm almost beating the guy. Like, no, you, when you get in the granularity, there's almost, you have no sh possibility um, ever. And it's the same thing when you look at a congressional map. When you look at the map in a granular way, you go, I mean, I mean, me personally, I think that that Time magazine piece explained 2020 that wasn't stolen. It was fortified. Narratives were manipulated. There there was um, mass hallucinations happening, hoax after hoax. It was unrelenting. And then people thought that Biden would be the cure for the self-inflicted mass hysteria. So I do think if we had even slightly less dishonest media, Trump would have won in, a, in a, like a mega landslide. I think that had COVID been handled better from the beginning. So here's my case for how Trump really would have won 2020. COVID's handled a little bit better in the beginning, i.e. blame the Democrats. There's a pandemic coming and Democrats are saying that there's not. Which, which side of the bet do you take, Mike? There's a comet coming and I'm saying there's no comet coming and you can you see it. You right away go, there is. Because even if you're wrong, the worst thing you did was said, well, I thought there was a comet. You can see it. And it looks like it was going to blow people up. I wanted to stop it. And then start, look at Cernovich, that idiot, not worried at all. And then if it does hit, you're like, hey, man, I was the one telling you. Right. So one, he handles it better by putting on the Democrats right away because people forget, again, March and April, Democrats were saying, oh, no, go to the go to the parades, go to the Chinatown parades. Don't let xenophobia win. There's no there's no pandemic. So Trump, if he handles it in January when he was being told that by, by, by the way, by Navarro and Bannon, then he wins the landslide. He I don't know that once Democrats took control of the narrative on covid and then our people denied that people were dying in nursing homes. That was kind of the pivotal tactical blunder of the time, because we know like I know people and, you know, people including Janice Dean, who like her parents died in nursing homes. So our side looked like kooks because our side was going, nobody, it's the flu. It's like, no, it isn't. Dude, the, there are people who lost multiple sets of parents and in-laws in nursing homes, right? So that, and that was the cause of Democrats. The current health secretary um, had taken his or her, I don't even know the genders anymore. I can't keep track, but, but took their, their person out of the nursing home while issuing an order that everyone else had to send their people to nursing homes if they tested positive for COVID. It was a nursing home genocide, 30 to 50,000 deaths, maybe 100,000. We'll never really know. All right. Well, why wasn't that pushed by Trump? Right. That's and then, then accusing people of wanting to kill grandma. So exactly. actually killing grandma and then accusing your opponents of wanting to. Right. So you, that's where, again, the Gen X boomer thing is different because we're more tactical. We're thinking, Hey, man, looks like a pandemic's coming. The smarter bet is to say, looks like a pandemic's coming. Let the Democrats deny it. If I'm wrong, then it moves on. People forget about it. If I'm right and people die, then it's their fault. And then I'll come in as the solution. Um, that's obvious. Handles the nursing home deaths differently. He wins. Once he totally lost control, and then he was like real-time A-B testing the lockdowns. Well, I, Sweden is paying a heavy price, but then he goes, but Sweden did the right thing. He looked kind of coherent. Um, he has a better debate, that, that first debate. He wins narrowly, but he wins. He had, mul he had multiple paths to victory. So 20, the riots, he didn't handle them with the aggression that we needed for the country. Polls so, show that people want the military to shut these things down. Didn't happen. When they tried to do a coup in the summer of 2020, where Trump was put in his bunker, put in his bunker by the Secret Service, you can't do that. You can't be the tough guy and you're in a bunker. Well, Secret and Mago go, well, Secret Service made him do it. Sure, but you can't do it. You just, you can't. This is where, again, the, the Maga brain fails 
is like, I get that they quote unquote made him. You're not telling me, I'm just saying that you can't do that. You can't be the strong guy who hides in a bunker by the left that you call soy boys. So the soy boys made you run into your bunker. Like, which is it, right? You, you have to kind of pick a narrative or pick a side that couldn't do that. And then he just let him kind of run wild, man. So then that led the public to think, well, if we vote for Biden, maybe all this will just stop. Maybe it'll just stop. And then, of course, you had mail-in ballots and you had a number of things. But, yeah, Trump should have won by a landslide. He didn't have it stolen. He had it narrative manipulated away from him. But had he handled it a little, little bit differently, he would have won a very, very narrow win like he had in 2016, which was very narrow. Then that's also, too, where Trump and his most ardent supporters gaslight their own followers. Oh, it was a landslide. I remember landslide 2016. No, what landslide? 80,000 votes, dude, four states. What landslide? When you when you actually look at the electoral map, especially for 2020, Georgia, I think, was like 18,000 votes, some some tiny amount that you, you wouldn't imagine. So when you go look at the granularity, you go, no, you barely won in 26, barely, and you barely lost in 2020, barely. And Democrats barely won a House majority, and Republicans barely won a House majority. Every every inch matters, and that's why I brought up that issue of the guy who's sprinting, you know, the Usain Bolt joke, because, like, you go to the gym, I go to the gym. End of the day, does it matter what we're doing? No. Go to the gym, do something, do some cardio. We're not world-class athletes, but as you yeah. get – where the, where the margin of victory is a hair, everything, everything matters. Everything matters. You can't just go in and 80, 20 it. I lifted, got a pump, did a little time in the cardio, walked my dog, doing good. No, no. Every You have to think, was that rep range the most appropriate for your sport? Everything has to matter. So that's the way that every election has to be looked at with people like Zelvin, DeSantis go, what are we, how are we going to win this one seat? Folks, one of the greatest accomplishments of my life, I'm saying this completely non-ironically, is being an underwear model for sheath underwear. I wear it every single day, and I love wearing it. What makes sheath special from other underwear is they've got two pouches for both parts of your male anatomy. It keeps you cool in the summer and keeps you warm in the winter. Their stretchy fabric is made out of this moisture-wicking technology. Keeps you nice and dry. You know where. If you know me, you know Sheath Underwear. And here's the thing. If you go to sheathunderwear.com, use promo code MALICE, you get 20% off today. You can inside my pants. That'll be a first. Sheathunderwear.com, promo code MALICE for 20% off. They're the most comfortable underwear you've ever put in your body. Support the underwear that supports the show and let them support you. Try it. It sounds weird. The first time I put them on, I'm like, what is this? And now I wear them literally every day. And I model for them because I'm such a hunk. This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Pettisey. I love hearing people's stories of resilience and grit. This is why I created this podcast. We are very excited to welcome Jim Gaffigan, Yasmin Mohammed, Glenn Beck, Tim Dillon, Abigail Schreier, Jeff Garland, Ayan Hirsi Ali, Sam Harris, Heather Hying, Jonah Goldberg, Ben Shapiro, Glenn Greenwald, Sarah Shahi, Colin Quinn. If there's a culture of victimhood, then let's tell stories of grit and survival. Subscribe and listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Well, and that's where you're going to need every tactician looking at every seat, every margin, uh, because the margin of victory is so small now. You have to, everything matters. The details matter. You can't be some bombastic guy and that's good enough. It isn't going to work. Are you surprised by how the midterms went against all the predictions? Yeah, I thought Republicans were going to do better for sure. I was I didn't know that they were going to do the take the Senate, but I thought it was going to be a much bigger win for Republicans. And I don't know if that was because I fell for the hyper polls. Maybe I don't understand the country as much anymore. Maybe mail in voting is a bigger issue than we realize. But then on the other hand, I looked at how Pelosi barely won too. And I'm at the position now where maybe this is just the way it is now. Every election is going to be really close. There's not going to be a blue wave. There's not going to be a red wave. There are going to be a bunch of seats that are hotly contested. 
and every every seat and every election matters and every vote matters. Um, let's shift gears a little bit because there's someone else who's kind of a Trump figure in some ways, and that's Andrew Tate. And I've been hearing a lot about him in recent weeks. From my perspective, he came out of nowhere and they're all my friends talking about him overnight. Uh, whenever that happens, that's completely an illusion. And that means someone's been actually putting in the work for months or years at a time. And then he just rises to prominence. People just kind of appear out of nowhere unless they're completely corporately sponsored, like the Greta Thunberg figure. Um, you also get attacked from some kind of guilt asso by association with him. Can you explain from your perspective, A, what is your relationship with him? And B, why do you think he's being made into this kind of public example of, I guess, maybe either what's wrong with men or what's right with men? The, yeah, the Andrew Tate was a 10-year overnight blast. Right. Because right. the, the, same the, same, the same thing happened with me. So I remember he, when he had a kickboxer verified account on Twitter, maybe 2013, 2014, and he was saying depression is fake. And he would go viral for that and people would kind of attack him. And then I think he finally got banned and <clears throat> in like 2015, but he had, and then he apparently had been on celebrity big brother, which I didn't know about. And then he got removed. So this is a guy who obviously had been a uh, kickboxing champion, had been trying to be in the limelight for a while. So I knew him in, Oh man, let's think. So I remember I'd see his stuff on depression. And, you know, we've talked about it before. My mom's bipolar. You just, like, depression is real. I've seen, I've seen what it does. It's a physiological condition. And I understood I understood he was, quote, unquote, trolling. But for me, there are just certain things I don't joke about. And one of them is depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, e any kind of mental health thing that could cause um, – because I like, cause I've seen it, right? I don't joke mm -hmm. about Alzheimer's. And maybe I'm boring in that way. But – you know, you follow me long enough to, to know that there are things I joke about. And then there are things that nah, I just, I don't think that's very funny. So I remember that. And then he disappeared, got banned. And then he kept coming back to Twitter with non-verified accounts. You know, he was one of those guys, like one after the other that he was banned. And then it was maybe 2018, 2019, he started a men's group called The War Room. And that okay. was a, a men's networking group, 2018, maybe 2019. It was a very small telegram group initially, but, and that's, what's weird about the wealth too. So as I was thinking about this the other day, a lot of people said, <clears throat> well, he didn't like own all those cars or this and that. And I go, no, I remember when they were just starting off, they had one Lamborghini that they shared and you know, you can get a used Lamborghini. I don't want to say for like only, but if you're not, and they've said they don't pay their taxes. So if you're not paying your taxes and you want a Lambo and you have some money, cash flow coming in, you can like, you can do that. I wouldn't buy one. I've never owned a supercar, but you, so you, you would see that. So yeah, they start off and then they did the, the Star Wars trolling. I think that was a big, another thing that put them on the map. So they kind of learned that that's, that's the way to level their attention. So they started the war room and then in about 2019, I think <clears throat> they had a war room summit. And then they said, do you want to come give a speech and go to, you know, Transylvania or whatever? So I was like, yeah, sure. Sure thing. So I flew out to Transylvania. I flew out to Romania, went out to Transylvania, posted pictures, which is why it's so bizarre. I've been bombarded for weeks with people like, you went, it's like, you know that I went there because I posted a selfie of me hiking. You know, you're not, it's, it's, that's enough. This is kind of, it's interesting you bring it both up because it segues to like the MAGA thing where it's like you're, you only know these things because I posted them because obviously I wasn't doing anything that I thought needed to not be hidden. So great scoop. You found pictures that I posted of me doing hikes, you know, con you know, congratulations. Transylvania, by the way, was quite lovely. This was pre COVID. I remember I was going to bring my family back the next year because Switzerland, it looks like Switzerland, but it's a third of the price. Switzerland is the only place I've traveled that has sticker shock. So I go there, speak at the war room summit, Transylvania, smoke some cigars, hang out, come back again. He's not famous at this time, right? He's just, like um, 
I would have, I would have been more famous than him. Um, as stupid as that is, like who's more famous or whatever, but he's not, a, he's not like a thing. And then they had war room summits, a couple of them in the U S so they had one in LA and then they had one in, I think Atlanta. So I went to one in Atlanta cigar night there and then, or his, you know, they had a cigar night and then they had the LA one and we did a podcast and then I kind of, they were kind of doing their thing. They were selling a lot of courses and other things. I'm not really big into course sales. So I would see them on the internet, but didn't really know what was going on. And then must have been late 2021, but I started seeing them with their follower count on Instagram was like hundreds of thousands a day. And I go, oh, they're probably buying followers because there's no, right. Cause in my, cause I don't, I'm not on TikTok. So this was like the biggest boomer moment of my life in recent memory is I watch some left wing real accounts on Twitter. And one of this left wing account was doing a takedown or, you know, quote unquote, takedown of something Tate had said. And then I messaged Andrew and I said, wow, Andrew, you must really be crossing over because there's this guy on a Twitter reel or a Facebook reel, Instagram reel talking about you. He goes, oh, no, he goes bro, 1.5 billion views on TikTok already. I was like, okay. <laughs> then I went on to TikTok and saw that he was the it thing. This was still before the big, but this was the, that initial wave. And I go, oh, so like, like I said, that was like the boomer moment because I was like, wow, you're on reels, not realizing that I'm so uncool that I don't know that everybody's on TikTok now, right? Because I had no clue. And then that was like the rise. And then... I think three months later, it's like 15 million, 15 billion views on TikTok, a level of fame and notoriety that I never heard of. And the next thing I know, they're on Man Cave. They're on like everywhere you look now, they're on every channel, every video is clipped, slice and dice, everything, everything, is, everything is on there. And I was like, oh, wow, these guys are like really famous. And so again, it was, yeah, when people go, oh, they came from out of nowhere and they were promoted by the CIA or something. No, they've been trying for a long time to, to do this, right? They've been around forever, but they finally found algorithmically what hit. So now they're like the biggest thing. And then you, Mike, you know, knowing me, I don't like clout chase on people. So I was never like, oh, I know these guys or, oh, this or that. I never even tried to do that. And the next thing I know, this was May, I think May of last year or uh, March or April last year. Then there's a whole story that they get arrested for sex trafficking, right? I'm like, well, that's weird because and a number of people have said this. They had, you know, you might not like Hustlers University. You might not like people who sell courses. They had at one time like fighting courses, iron mine. There's people who don't like the course hustle. Mm -hmm. And me personally, I'm, I don't sell courses, but I don't, I don't. Like I'm not down on it. And it was like, dude, they were, they were doing the e-commerce stuff for like ever. And you, like, why would they be doing this? It just never, it just didn't make any sense to me. Right. It was like, they've had a internet business forever. And then it's like, wait, and as you're getting famous, then you do this and you kidnap an American. When you're, when you're at the, like the height of your, the, the drug cartels in Mexico aren't going to kidnap Americans, but you right. are like, well, that's weird. But like usual, I don't, defend or convict without evidence because I'm not going to defend somebody and then have people go, Oh, you, you know, you're really wrong on that. Cause it's like, well, I don't know. Cause now of course what people are doing is they're using Google translate from articles in Romania of news outlets they've never heard of. And then people are like, Oh yeah, they're guilty. It's like, okay, so you're using Google translate. You don't know anything about the country. You don't know anything about the legal system, but now you, but you know, and then of course they're in the, issue of, well, they got released. I think it was after a day. And their story was that an American woman was cheating on her boyfriend. The boyfriend saw she was at a party. Boyfriend then calls the embassy. Then there's video clearing them. They got released. And then sure enough, okay, they're released. So in my mind, I was like, okay, these things happen. They're, they're released. And then December, the big one happens. And then that's when it, you know, it's huge. And it was like, so it was so bizarre. And I'll tell you why. And Joe Rogan had a good 
segment on this too. If they did this, then to me, this is a very, it's like, it's weird when people are attacking me. It's like, I believe sex traffickers deserve the death penalty. You're, you're like, you're talking to the wrong guy here, right? I also believe you have a trial and you have evidence because as we learn in the, the Johnny Depp case, you read things and then you find out that they're maybe not quite totally accurate. Even the Harvey Weinstein thing, I read the trials. And if, if you looked at the trials, what he did, and what he was convicted of in the court of public opinion totally different. So when I read, you know, so the Harvey Weinstein thing, he was doing, you know, hard R, all the really bad stuff. And then it turns out he was like a scumbag and a groper. Okay, not good things. The last thing I'll do is defend Harvey. But that's not the impression that I got right. from press coverage. So for me, I'm not going to say this person would never, you know, would never do this. And I'm also not going to say, oh, I'm going to use Google Translate to convict someone. So now that now people are like, oh, but you were there. It's like, yeah, I spoke at the War Room Summit. I posted pictures. Like you haven't, you haven't. So then this is like a cudgel to try to attack me, which is weird because you was like you only know because I went and posted pictures. You know, and any, anybody who knows me knows I'm the most paranoid person in the world. Like I'm texting people regularly when I'm out of town. There's no unaccounted for time in my life because I live under the assumption that people are trying to frame me for things. So then it's like, okay, so you people don't even actually care. Like, I actually give a shit. So I actually give a shit about human trafficking and sex trafficking. I actually care. I don't think – so when they got arrested, then Greta's like, oh, you didn't recycle your cardboard. And they're all like laugh. It's like funny. It was – nobody gave a shit. The whole thing was, oh, ha, 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 this guy that we don't like got arrested. It wasn't – this is like mortifying what's going on here. Let's look into it. The left is on all right because I remember reading Reddit during the arrest. They were just gleeful that somebody they didn't like was arrested for something. They didn't actually care if they're real victims and there's real suffering. And that was why I think Joe Rogan had one of the better takes was Joe's like, when I say I hope it isn't true, it's not because I'm supportive. It's the opposite. It's because I'm against it. Because if it's true, then a lot of people suffered. It's, a, it's like a bad thing, right? And you, you would hope you would hope that the bad things didn't happen. But then then it's not really about that at all. It's about, oh, we'll use this now to attack me or we'll use this to attack everybody whose podcast he ever went on or we'll use this against Joe Rogan now. We'll use this against everybody and we'll crack jokes and then we're going to convict. And then it was it was like one thing after another to where, yeah, it's been constantly bombarded. And as you know, I don't, I'm not going to talk to you if you talk to me this way, right? I've it's like, you, if you just come out and say some shit, like what were you doing in Romania without your wife? Oh yeah, you're right. I left my wife and she didn't know I was gone because that, that because that's possible. I just vanished into the wilderness and, and resurfaced taking pictures. And she's like, I can't believe you did that to me. How dare you lie to me? You said you were with Michael Malice in Austin, Texas. How dare you, right? So for me, you're, you're, in, you're in this weird, like where you're being like gaslit that you did something that you were trying to hide when the only reason anybody knows is because you you didn't have anything to hide. You didn't see anything untoward. It was a, it, it was, we, we rented little um, cars and drove through Bucharest. There, there's like little, they're like go-karts. The, the idea that these guys, if, the, if they are, I've, I've talked to a, a kind of a spiritual advisor about this. And I said, if they did this, then, cause I'm, I'm very, I have very good instincts on people. And I'm like, if they did this, I'm just, my worldview is upside down because they had normal girlfriends. Cause I'd read all this stuff in the press and they go, Oh yeah. You, you know, Andrew beat up his girlfriend or whatever all these years ago. And he oppresses all these people who are poor. And I was like, no, they're they're educated, intelligent people. They're they're not, um, like they're not they're not what you would see in the media. So the media would say, "Oh, Tristan's girlfriend was this." I was like, "I met her. She was British. Had her own opinions. She didn't really talk to us or not really care." But this wasn't somebody that you you know you went into Libya in some market or something, right? Right, right. It was so that to me is the issue that I've been wrestling with. It's not the people just being nasty because they'll find anything of course. to go after me for. It's just more like if these guys were doing that. But then, of course, the the problem 
that they're going to face because I'm actually a lawyer and I actually look things up. So Romania has a law that if you bring someone to do webcam work, they can still consider that a crime. And the, they call it, they say the consent of the victim is irrelevant. So America has this law too, it's called the Mann Act. So under the Mann, it's just never enforced. So under the Mann Act, if you tell someone, hey, you know, fly out to, to hang out with me in Vegas and she's, you know, 22 or whatever. So there's no underage thing. You say, hey, you fly, fly out and hang out with me and I'll pay you to fornicate. That's actually a crime. It's under the Mann Act. Uh, is the, the use of interstate commerce for quote unquote immoral acts. There's even a famous case where a, uh, a black man back when he had miscegen uh, miscegenation laws drove his white girlfriend across state lines. And that was considered an immoral act because of the interracial nature of the relationship. So then when I actually went behind the, you know, when I tried to figure out what was really going on, they might actually be in trouble because it doesn't matter if the people said, no, I want to do it. That, that, so, so people are calling it slavery. That, that's a whole different thing. So when you think of trafficking, you think somebody gets kidnapped, taken against their will. It's like the movie Taken. But under Romanian law, they, can't, they want to argue, in my, they can argue that it doesn't matter. We, this, is an immoral, this is a morals thing. So they may be in peril, even if some of the other more uh, um, scandalous things aren't really true. And that, so that to me, because like I said, I actually looked, looked it up and looked into it. So that could be a problem for them because that Romania has a type of man act. Um, one of the things that you have taught me, which has profoundly uh, made my life better in terms of social media and something I advise others to do even, and I rarely advise people of anything, but this is something I feel comfortable advising everyone is to be more liberal in terms of who you let into your public space. Uh, I was friends years ago with Martha Marsh, I forget her name. She ran the cuddle parties and I asked her, all right, how do you guys handle this? And she goes, you have to, everyone will take as much space as you let them. And it's incumbent on you. And that's in a physical uh, context where you're actually there for the purpose of physical contact with other humans, which is something that is kind of laughed at, but is actually extremely important. She have to tell people, all right, stop. This is my line. And otherwise they will assume they can just keep going. And same thing in social media, people will keep going until you draw the line and, and tell them. Uh, can you break down a little bit more why you are so uh, liberal in terms of blocking people from your space instead of just muting them? It's a kind of an esoteric question, but I think the, the upside is uh, very profound in terms of uh, quality of life and mental health on, in an uh, internet age. Yeah, I learned this in real life. Where, and every time I broke the rule, it ended very well. People go, don't be judgmental give that person another chance. They mean well. And well, the odds say no. The right. odds say that this is it's not going to work well. The odds say that if I see 10 people and I don't like the looks of all 10 of them, one of them are probably good, but nine are bad. So the side of that bet is a bad one. So I learned in just real life that ha negative people are a drain on your time. They create drama. They often lie. Even... I mean, just, just another example, when you're a public figure, like you have someone at a podcast or you speak at a public event, that in itself can alter the course of your life, right? And that's when you're just thinking this, this is a normal thing. It's not even a weird thing. So people are toxic people, spiritual vampires. They drain you in real life. And then, of course, on the internet, they do that, but they do it at scale. That's what I always tell people. If you're, if you're a social media prominent person, you're dealing with humanity at scale. Yeah, That's why people go, oh, why do you block so many people? Okay, well, what do you do with your million follower account? I'm not flexing. I'm just saying, how do you manage thousands of people, sometimes tens of thousands of people a day, correcting you about things that they're wrong about, telling you that you know, you're boring, accusing you of the most heinous things, ye you know, yelling at you for not conforming to whatever they're political or worldview is how, like, how do you handle that? Well, the answer is you can not read replies, right? I think Rogan says he just doesn't even read them because he, he's too nice to block people. Right. But then you realize, well, that's the mistake though, because you, you want to draw boundaries. So when I block people, I'm doing two things. One is I'm protecting my space because mm -hmm. I read my replies and I like my replies. And I like to see when you have something to say and other people do. And I want to, I want to read that. And I also want to read from, the mob and know what's on what's the zeitgeist 
What are, well, like what's on people's minds, even if it's cuckoo? I like to know these things. So if you're jumping in in an obnoxious or disrespectful way, you're just you're disrupting what I want to do, which is like I want to read people. And then two is I wish this had happened to me. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and I said, you know, the reply guys that I deal with are karma because I was the most arrogant, insufferable <laughs> young man from, I don't know. 19 to 28, 21, depends on how you define it. I knew everything. I would tell lawyers how they should try cases. When I was still in law school, I would tell everybody everything. So I'm dealing with that karmic debt here <laughs> for that. But what I wish, because, and a lot of guys, what they would do was, like, I had some pretty good mentors. They sort of ghosted me. And what I wish that somebody had said was, hey, man, you're kind of annoying. You don't actually really know this. You're on the right track, but maybe maybe don't tell me things, right? But it's easier to avoid that confrontation with someone, and you just don't you just stop calling them, and you, and you you don't have because you don't want to deal with the drama of falling out, which I've also learned is the smarter approach. Ghosting people is better because, like when I was a reply guy, it came from a good place. So if somebody had told, but I'm the one in ten where it comes from a good place, where I would have been mortified to think, oh my gosh, I can't believe that I cross that line with you. And that was probably really annoying. I would have felt bad about it before. Right. But the odds are that the person you try to correct is going to create like metadrama. Right. You, you know, that just like you try to of break course. up with someone, you can't break up with them. They're just like that with friends or mentorship relationships. Oh, well, I can't believe you. Well, you need to work on yourself. It's like, Oh gosh. So it's now about me now when I'm the one trying to get out of the relationship. So what, when I block people, it, it, I feel bad. I honestly do. I honestly got to feel bad. And I'll tell you why. A lot of these people are men. They're lonely. They don't have a lot going on in their lives. They're living in kind of a dingy apartment or they're living at home and they have all this unexpressed masculinity, which by the way, that's why, you know, I don't know if we're, we're we got our hard limit, but I would love to talk more about the, just like the Tate phenomena and not the just malicious lies. People are trying no, to please, please people. go on. Yeah. That's like a whole other thing. The, the, before they were going to be arrested, I had this whole article, and maybe I'll still publish it, which was the secular world didn't have a response to the tapes because here's why. Secular world says, hey, go start only fans when you're 18. Okay, so you're a groomer because they're going, oh, well, they, they find these girls who are 18 and they have them do webcam. Well, why though? Because society says sex work is empowering. Go, you know, can't be a prostitute. You're a sex worker. It's empowering. Go do an OnlyFans. Go, you know, go, sh go show your butt on Instagram if you don't want to do an OnlyFans. If you're a woman, you know, that, that's how you should reduce yourself to your flesh because it's like empowering. And then if you're a man, tell, you know, you're a loser. You don't matter. Nobody cares. So there's no, there's no, there's no outlet. So when guys attack me, I feel bad because I know that a lot of them are hurting. Some of them are malicious and they're bad actors and that's a whole different problem. But I know that a lot of them are hurting. And I'm like, man, I feel bad because he probably needs my message. But this is a boundary issue. And then I hope this could be a rationalization. But my hope is that people realize, oh, man, this guy just doesn't want me around. Maybe maybe I need to do some inner work because I've, you know, I've been blocked by people. And I thought, yeah, I kind of deserve that. And that's my that's my hope because I do feel and a lot of times I do say prayer for the people before I block them and everything just that's bizarre I have a very complicated relationship because on the one hand I, I want to protect my mental health on the other hand I do want to give people feedback and not but not indulge them but I do want them to know that I like I do feel bad I know you're hurting I know you're suffering life's not going the way you thought it would so that's kind of what led to and, that, and that's an irony, irony thing. And the two things is the tapes making their rise. I didn't really mention them much because a lot of their material is material that I don't agree with. Putting aside the you know the sexual stuff and the fornication and everything. You ever see me flex a watch? In all the years right, you know me right, on the internet, right. you ever see me flex a car? You, you know, you ever see me do? So I, I believe that that's it's, there's actually a section in Guerrilla Mindset where I talk about status seeking goods. I'm actually opposed to secular status oriented culture where you demonstrate your worth to society due to your material possessions. I'm, I'm like, I'm against that. 
And I, and I've always been against that. I don't think it's necessarily like immoral, but that's not my message. But the secular world is for that. The secular world is your life should be a beer commercial. They tell you that you should have all of these things and then you don't have all of these things. And then you become miserable as a man, you become suicidal. The messaging that they give you isn't messaging that's coherent with the world, right? So that's why when they go, well, there's bad actors on dating and you're just like, well, okay, but you got like Vice, for example, one day Vice is publishing an article with a one-sided text message ex exchange that looks pretty bad because it's, you know, it's very BDSM oriented and they don't include the woman's responses, of course. They call it recreated text. I'm like, oh, okay. So you're only showing these one set of texts. But then the next day they publish an article about how women are into these, you know, depraved fantasies. So the secular world is like, hey, if you have kinky text with someone, then you're a criminal. But here's an article on how a lot of people actually are into that kink. Oh, and Fifty Shades of Grey sold however many tens of millions of copies. Right. Of the biggest book of the decade. Oh, when it did it, I don't know, trillion dollars. It was like the Lord of the Trilogies trilogy for women. Oh, but you, so you can't talk about that. Or if you do that, you're, you're participating in our culture, right? So imagine, and I, I've, I've done this before. I'm 45. So happy I'm not young. Every gray hair, I'm glad to have it. I, and I just try, imagine you're just like 22 and you're trying to like figure it out. Here's what you're going to be told. Um, oh yeah, you need to like be nice. Don't don't be like assertive. And right. then you like go out and you're just, so you're just like looking around like, hey, oh, is she flirting with me? Well, I don't know. If I go over there, is she gonna post my picture on TikTok? If I go to the gym now, there's guys who are afraid now at the gym because if you get in someone's shot while they're lifting, then they there's a whole genre now where they shame you as a gym creeper when you're just like, dude, I just wanted to lift. No, no, it's bad out there, right? It's really bad out there. So you're a guy and then you're told all these messages. So it just doesn't work. So then what happens is there's a hyper masculine response to that, which is, oh, actually you shouldn't be poor. You're a brokey. You're a loser. And with a lot of men that you can encourage men that way, right? Like if you're selling to women, you know, go to Barnes and Noble. If you sell to women, you go, you are a badass, right? You right. Just yeah. bad. If you try to sell that to men, you're, you're, you, you wouldn't 10 copies, right? You would say to the man, you are a loser. And P.S., here's how not to be kind of a loser. So the secular world doesn't, and I, and I say secular because if you're a religious person, you would just say your ultimate goal is to sanctify yourself. And so this is kind of a whole moot conversation anyway. But the secular world, they don't have an answer. And then when Jordan Peterson, who was not offensive at all, was around, they crucified Peterson. So you're, it's like, okay, there, there's... It's maybe overplayed, but it, probably not, which is if you kill someone who isn't really bad and you call them bad, and then someone who is bad arrives, you've lost the power now to call that person bad. So the same people who killed Jordan Peterson, you know, metaphorically, I mean, what they did to that man was disgraceful. And, you know, from our other podcasts that we talked about, I have my own opinions on Jordan Peterson and other matters, but that that's not relevant to this. What they did to that man was disgraceful. They claimed that he wanted to force women to be basically slaves, force monogamy. I mean, if you think about it, they, they everything that they're accusing the Tates of, to some degree, they accused Jordan Peterson of, and it was so ridiculously fake when they said it to Jordan. Now they're going, why don't these guys agree with us now that these Tate guys are bad? They're bad. We're telling. Well, you, you said that about Jordan though, and you said Jordan was basically uh you know he wanted to force women to be married to men that they don't want there's a word for that and that's the word that you're using you know on the tapes now so there, there's no so there's no secular there was no way to secularly take him down the tapes down and that's why they're, they're doing all this criminal stuff and then that's why a lot of people are skeptical of the criminal charges as well so there's a lot of layers to to the the tape situation which is like if you don't like them I'm not here to say who sh anybody should like or not like. If you don't like them, okay, like, are you promoting Jason Wilson? Oh, no. So Jason Wilson's done a lot, a lot of work with black masculinity and a lot of the trauma that the boys who are raised by single mothers deal with. Like, they're not promoting him. Okay, well, are you promoting Jordan Peterson? Oh, no, you, you claim Jordan wanted to make women slaves to men. 
okay, so who are you promoting? So the answer isn't these guys are bad. Don't listen to them. The answer is th th these guys are bad. You need to follow the New York Times and Washington Post guidebook to life, which, by the way, if you follow, you ended up like, remember Glenn Thrush, that New York Times White House correspondent? Right. And he got canceled for sexual you know, misconduct. And then when you went and looked at it, what happened was a woman wanted him as a mentor, but he didn't really know how to read signals. And because everything is so broken, he kind of made a clumsy attempt for a kiss, not realizing like she just wants to be a mentor. Whereas if Glenn Thrush had followed more traditionally masculine voices, they all would have just said, like, you're kind of a dork. And if you know you're a dork, you're less likely to to make a move like that because you're like, oh, yeah, she probably lied to me. I'm kind of a dork. I should not be a dork. And then the signals would be more obvious. Remember Neil deGrasse Tyson? They tried to cancel him yep. because they said he like he shook a woman's hand and it was like a Swahili love handshake. People forget all this. That's why your autism and my autism is that we're like we're national treasures because we just remember all this, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and but if you look at what Neil Tyson was doing with the woman through the lens of how there's no good advice for men, you realize he liked her, but he didn't want to make a move because he thought he could be in trouble. So he kind of made half a move, hoping that she would make a bigger move. She didn't. So he does nothing else. That's exactly, by the way, if you're a, resp a respectable guy, that's what you would do. You're like, oh, okay, I, I misread the signal. I didn't come off aggressive. I just, she didn't want to like shake my hand back that way. And you're still in trouble now because she did a Swahili friendship handshake and your, you know, your hand lingered too, too long in her forearm or something. Like, I think she said he caressed his her form, something crazy like that. So again, the the indictment metaphorically is that, okay, so who are, who are men allowed to read? That's why I ask people when they tell me somebody's bad. I go, okay, I just like we talked about Trump, I'll just accept your frame as true. You, you think these are bad guys. Great, like who should they listen to? Oh, nobody. Oh, okay, so nobody. And why is Bill Gates allow in public when he met with Epstein post conviction. Right. So the whole thing is like, well, if I'm a bad guy, cause I spoke at a conference before anything like this had ever surfaced. Right. And that's the rule. It's like, okay, but Jeffrey Epstein had already been convicted when all this stuff happened. Right. So then you realize again, there's, there's no coherence to this. And that's why the, it's unfortunately becoming a little chaotic and a little problematic out there. One of the other things, you know, in this kind of Lamborghini, um, lifestyle for lack of a better term or ideal is that it's impossible to tell young men uh like that that life is infinitely better for you in your 40s than in your 20s i couldn't have heard that in my 20s my 20s were hardly ideal and i'm sure you'd agree that your life is much better now in your 20s especially being a dad and so on and so forth in your 40s than it was in your 20s um do, can you just briefly do you agree with that point and and why do you think you would have been able to hear that uh, when you were in your 20s yeah, especially in your 30s, because the 30s is a sweet spot where you're still physically pretty yeah. beastly. And the the reason, and this is why I've always been against status goods, is that you when you you have to so you have to the rules are this. You have to care about what society thinks because you do participate in a society. Sure. But you don't have to internalize or believe that you should have to participate. It's just like, okay, I'm gonna put on a suit and go to work. This is stupid, but it's what I have to do for my job. Like, I, But my suit isn't my identity. So if I, for example, were trying to do be um, like a real estate agent or something, then I would have to have a Rolex or a Patek, and I would have to drive a certain kind of car, and, and I would be like, this is stupid. Um, but my self-worth wouldn't be tied into it. So what happens is that too many men are told that your self-worth should be tied into the status-seeking goods have you ever had Jeffrey Miller on your podcast? Product yeah, product? and I, yeah, yeah, I, so I just hung out with him not that long ago. Great, great. Yeah, so his book on this I had read years ago is what primarily influenced me, Spent, which uh, or Thrift or something, Spending Ourselves to Death. And the book was th about the evolutionary basis of why we do these status-seeking goods. So I wear my watch because it shows people that I can get provisions, and then women are attracted to that, men, blah, blah, blah. Right. So you can play the game, but that's not where your self-worth comes in. Your happiness, contentedness, I don't, I don't consider myself happy necessarily, but you're just your inner self becomes so much, your inner life becomes so much more fulfilling 
when it is your inner life. Sure, if I have to go do something, I can go play the game. If I need to mog someone on Twitter, I know how to do that. But that's not where my identity and my self-worth is. My identity is tied to my heart. It's tied to the love I have for people. It's tied to the relationships I have with people. And now more so than anything, that's on a microcosmic basis amplified because people are sending me all these nasty messages when I'm with my kids at the movies. And right before the movies, I get a bunch of nasty messages. And I thought, you worms think that I care what you think? Right. You, you, you really th- – and it's like a surreal thing where – these two little girls that I'm about to watch Puss and Boots with are what I care about <laughs> right. and the love that I have. And you guys think you're going to rattle me, some little worm, you're going to rattle me. And But in their mind, they think that their approval of me or disapproval of me should carry some kind of content, some kind of moral weight. So as you get older, at least if you evolve, and a lot of men don't, but at least if you evolve, you realize that you learn the rules of life, play yep. the game. But know that it's just fake or, you know, the more offensive way of saying it's, it's fake and blank. Yeah. I won't say that because I'm canceled enough. But it's just, <laughs> it is. It's just fake. I'll do it. That's what I got to do. But my self-worth, my identity, none of that is wrapped in there. My identity, my self-worth, my inner life is wrapped in love. It's wrapped up in the relationships I have with people. It's wrapped in like, what if everything were taken away from you? What would really matter? Yep. That's another thing too when you get older. And you, you think about it, when you're young, maybe you have some financial crisis and you feel like your whole world is ending and you realize like nobody gives <laughs> like when you like just think about when you were a kid, you didn't care if your parents had any money. You cared if your parents were nice to you, the kind you, how like how they treated you. More money would have been nice, but that wasn't what would really have bothered you. So as you do get older and evolve and hopefully you do find some more inner peace and inner joy because you realize that fundamentally it's the love and the relationships you have with other people that are going to carry you forward. I could not agree more with everything you just said. Mike, we're running out of time. What has been your favorite part of this interview? I like that we got into why status goods are bad. I'm glad you had Jeffrey Miller on it. I think that's something more people should give some thought to, which is, am I doing this because I have to play the game? Fine. Or am I doing this because that really is making me feel something? And if it is making me feel something, maybe that's a pathway that I don't want to go down. You are welcome. All month long on Pluto TV, stream the biggest Tyler Perry movies free. Watch your favorites like Medea's Witness Protection and Medea's Big Happy Family. Join Tyler Perry as he goes on a couple's retreat with Sharon Leal in Why Did I Get Married? Or Idris Elba and Gabrielle Union in the Tyler Perry directed film Daddy's Little Girls. Plus, Pluto TV has hundreds of channels with thousands more movies and TV shows. Available on live and on demand. Download the free Pluto TV app on all your favorite devices and start streaming now. Pluto TV. Drop in. Watch free.